Hello, everyone. I am Corey Andrew Powell. And, you know, you may notice that my environment looks a little different. I am recording from a different location today, kind of in the suburbs a little bit. So you may hear birds chirping and all kinds of nature, poss possibly. But in any event, I am really thrilled to be joined today by former NBA player turned successful entrepreneur, Dre Baldwin. Now, Dre's story is not just about overcoming obstacles. It's also about turning setbacks into stepping stones towards success from being overlooked on the high school basketball team to crafting a thriving career in professional basketball across eight countries. Dre's journey is a testament to the power of perseverance and self-belief. He's the author of two books, The Overseas Basketball Blueprint and Work on Your Game, Use the Pro Athlete mindset to dominate your game and business sports and life. Dre Baldwin, welcome to Motivational Mondays. Thank you for having me on, Corey. I'm excited to be here. Thank you, sir. Yes, we are excited you are here as well. And as I told you off camera, you know, inspirational stories are what we do. And so yours is definitely an inspirational story. But let's begin with your journey, really, from uh, as you share the story of being cut, if you will, from your high school basketball team uh, sure. to then ending up professionally playing in eight different countries. I mean, that's incredibly inspiring. So talk about that that journey. Sure. So uh, as you said, I was a late bloomer in sports. So that's how I ended up getting cut three times because I wasn't really good. I didn't really become good at basketball probably till after my senior year of high school, right before college. And then luckily I got the opportunity to play in college and I was able to you know blossom and get better. So by the time I got to the pro level, I was, you know, I felt like I was actually good and I could compete with anybody, but uh, started pretty late in, in basketball, even though I was always playing sports growing up, tried a little bit of everything, but finally settled on basketball around age 14. And then going to college, I went to, I was going to go to school just for school, period, because clearly I wasn't getting, I wasn't getting recruited for sports. So wherever I went, I was going to try out for the team. So luckily right. I went to a place that had a pretty small sports program. So I was able to get that opportunity and do my thing, but I was only playing at the division three level, which is not a level that produces pro athletes. So mm. most of my teammates and my, even our opponents, most of them didn't have these ambitions of becoming professional athletes. They were just playing sports because the sport was available because we were you no know, there in school. Getting out of college, getting out of a Division three school, it's not like anybody was knocking down my door to come play pro basketball. So my first year out of school, I worked a couple regular jobs, worked at uh, Bally Total Fitness on gym memberships, worked at Foot Locker as an assistant manager. Then I went to this thing called an exposure camp. You ever heard of those, Corey? No. no. Mm -mm. I did like a job fair, but for athletes. Okay. So instead of showing up with your resume and shaking hands, you actually bring your sneakers and you play. So I went to a exposure camp, did pretty well there. And these events are only like two days. So it's not mm -hmm. like this month long thing. This is like a two day event. Right. Played pretty well at the exposure camp, got a good scouting report and got some good footage. And I leveraged that into going and finding me a basketball agent where I basically had to sell myself to the agents. And it was usually mm. the other way around. So I had to go try to get an agent to represent me. I found one. And he was able to get me my first job. And this was the time frame for everybody, 2005. So I started my pro basketball career in 2005 playing in Countess, Lithuania. So that's how I got into the pro basketball game. Wow. That's such an amazing story. It really is because th there's a lot of layers there. One is that you had a vision, right? And nobody was going to actually deter you from that vision, even though you had all these obstacles that kept coming at you. And I think there's also... Uh, a lot of room for self-doubt, right? If you didn't really get far as you thought you would by that high school level, there's a lot of opportunity yeah. for you to second guess your own ability. So what yeah. stopped you from doing that? Man, that's a great question. And I think number one is I've always been a competitor. So I was competing not against a person at that time. I was really just competing against a circumstance. Mm. I was competing against a situation and I didn't want that situation to be the final the final paragraph or say final chapter of my athletic career. Cause I was always right. athletic as a kid and played a little bit of, again, dabbling in a bunch of sports. So I knew, uh, at least I had it in my mind that I knew I was going to make it as an athlete, that my mark, at least initially my mark on the world was going to be through sports. Mm. And since I tried every other sport. Now I was down to basketball. It's like my last chance. I said, this can't be the end of it. I have to keep going. So yeah. I, I guess you had to say I was dumb enough to keep trying, even <laughs> though the reality, Corey, the reality clearly said, hey, this guy is not uh, going to make it as an athlete. He might make it as something, but it's not going to be an athlete. So I was really just fighting against that circumstance. So again, the my ignorance was bliss, I guess you could say, and that I didn't know what I didn't know, that I wasn't supposed to keep believing in myself, given the reality in front of me. Mm. I think uh, one thing that I tell people is the good news is that 
this was in the time frame that it was because had it been now and I was that same kid, 16, 17 years old with no success, I would have been looking on social media and seeing all the other kids who are you know, actually going to go somewhere. I would have seen what they were doing. I probably would have been more discouraged because mm, yeah. I would have been comparing myself to the entire world of people my age who are, this is what it looks like when you're going somewhere. Mm. Whereas back in the nineties and you are, there are other kids there who are better than you, but the only people you see are the people in your neighborhood. Now right. you only see the people in your environment. So in my neighborhood, there were only like maybe five or 10 guys better than me. But had mm -hmm. I been looking on Instagram, I would have seen 5,000 guys better than me. I would have said, Oh, no way. This isn't happening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Since I only saw a handful, I said, All right, I could, I could kind of beat these five, 10 guys. So <laughs> that's, that's all I was competing against. So right, right. it was just the, it was the ignorance. It was the, the competitiveness. It was just the discipline as well. Because mm -hmm. again, I started late. So I knew that when I was 14 and all the other kids in my neighborhood were way better than me, I understood that or they've been playing since they were five years old. I just right. thought, so let me keep practicing and maybe I'll catch up to them. Now, there was no guarantee that I would because not like just because you practice something, you're going to become a pro at it. Mm -hmm. it's not everything ain't for everybody. But as I kept practicing, I could feel myself getting better, even though I didn't have any of the tangible results yet. I didn't really start getting tangible results from basketball until my freshman year of college. So I've been playing for about four or five years before I started getting any real results. And most people, Corey, don't go that long without getting a tangible result before they quit. Mm. And I, mm -hmm. I noticed this even in my neighborhood, like the other kids, my age, everybody plays basketball. Like you come from where I come from. I'm from Philadelphia. So when you're in the inner city, every young man plays basketball at some yeah. point. At least we try. Right. Mm -hmm. So I could see the kids, what they would try out for the high school team, or even a local recreational team once or twice, don't make it or you make it and you don't play. They would just stop playing basketball. Like, all right, basketball obviously isn't for me. And I could see them just, I would still see them in a the neighborhood, but they were no longer like hardcore trying to be a basketball player. Right, I could see it right. in, even in high school, same thing. Like Freshman somewhere, year. like like something, somewhere, something discouraged them and derailed yes. that dream, right? Right. Or even if it even was a dream in the first place, right? mm. some of them, they, they said, all right, I'll play as long as it looks like this is going to work. But as soon as it's quote unquote obvious that it's not, they would just move on to do something else. Right. So that's what would happen with a lot of them. And I would see them just slowly fall by the wayside. So it was less and less competition. The longer I was able to persevere, even in high school, freshman year. Every freshman tried out for the team. Then sophomore year was a few less of us. Junior year, less. Senior year was like three of us of seniors who tried out for the team. So I could see each year it was kind of like a war of attrition. And <laughs> that the longer it went, the fewer people were still trying if they didn't already have a result. If you right. didn't get results early, then most people would just drop out of the game. Mm. So I started to notice this. So, okay, I just stayed in the game. All right, I have less competition now just because I stayed in the game than – when I first got in the game. So yeah, yeah. I kept noticing that year after year after year, even through college, the same thing happened. Fewer people were trying the older we got and the more it became obvious, at least in their eyes, that this wasn't going to be the thing. Now, yeah. this is not to say that they were all wrong because everybody can't become a basketball player. Well, <laughs> yes, let me actually um, just actually talk uh, touch on that point because you said um, – quite a few amazing like sort of uh lessons in leadership that we share a lot with our community but but they're sort of um sometimes at conflict with each other and what i mean by that is for example you are an example of someone who said you know what i have a dream i have a vision and i'm going to keep going and keep practicing and keep practicing until i get it but there's right. also the idea which i don't fault people for knowing some people wake up and they realize you know what I'm better at other things. This mm -hmm. isn't my forte. And sometimes we also encourage to focus on the things you're really, really good at. Be honest about yourself, about the things you're mediocre at and focus right. on your strengths, uh, your strengths versus, you know, your, what you're average at. So it, it could go either way. I, would, I don't want to discourage anyone and tell them not to spend five or six years trying because it could have great results as you clearly did. But, you know, right. sometimes after a couple of years, you're like, you know, maybe I'm not going to do this. And, but I'm That's a really right. good hockey player or a singer or, you know, so it, I guess it just depends on the person and the situation. Yes, it does. And it requires us, we had to be very discerning because mm -hmm. you can't get years back. Right. right? right. So whatever, amount of, whatever <laughs> amount of time you take, you got to make sure or get some help 
uh, make sure that you're doing you're in the right vehicle. And this mm -hmm. is one of the things that I talk about. Uh, we talk about over here. We call them the, the 12 commandments of the work on your game philosophy. And one of them is choosing the right vehicle. Now, you got to be right. in the right vehicle in order to get to where you want to go. Because mm -hmm. before basketball, I played baseball for several years. And I realized, okay, I'm not that good at baseball. I don't care how hard I work. Uh, this ain't going anywhere. Right, right. right. Yeah, we all can't be Deion bullshit. Sanders or Tiki Barber or whoever they, you know, playing yeah, like exactly. five sports. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I knew that my ceiling in baseball would have been sitting on the bench in high school, let alone college. Mm -hmm. So I had to walk away from baseball in order to get to the thing that might work, which was basketball. And again, yeah. then I was able to persevere. And luckily, it worked out for me. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work out for everybody. So yeah, you, yeah. you, you got to be discerning about who you are and where you're going. Yeah, very wise advice indeed. And it also reminds me as we're talking about um, you know basketball and 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 uh, specifically as a sport, where I'm from uh, is not too far from Philly. I'm from Trent, eh, Trenton, New Jersey, okay. and yeah. uh, Philly is my old stomping grounds when I first started hanging out and you know going out as a kid, teenager. Yeah. But um, we had uh, by NBA standards a a short guy in Trenton who was like, "No, I'm going to the pros. I'm going to the pros." And they were like, okay, you can play, but you real little, dude. Like, you're not going to the pros. And his name was Greg Grant. And um, I remember him. Yeah. And Greg was like, you know, by NBA, he's probably taller than me, but I'm 5'9", right? But but by NBA standards, he was not a tall guy. And and many yeah. people consider that to have been a handicap. But he was like, no joke when he got that ball. So uh, he ended up playing. And he was one of our success he stories here in Trenton. And so yeah. um, I, there's another layer to your story again, which is, even if the odds seem against you and you have that passion and vision, do not let others discourage you. You, as you just said, make that discerning right. call for yourself. Don't let anyone else put that on you until right. you decide it's time to move on or continue. Uh, very often the voice that we have in our head is the doubtful one that other people have put in it, not our own. I've noticed. That's right. 100%. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So, okay. Well, wow. That's, that's your backstory. And then how does it transition then to you going from a professional athlete to entrepreneur? Like what was that first business and how has that propelled you to where you are today? Sure. So I got to give a couple of pieces of a backstory here, mm -hmm. basically four, four points where all this happened. So the first one was in about 2002. This is when I'm in college. I responded to this bulletin board posting that said, make some extra money on the side as a college student, which is every college student is looking to make some extra money, especially right. when you're an athlete. Because this is before the days of name, image, and likeness deals, where nowadays athletes can make money just from being athletes. Whereas right. back in the day, you were banned from making mm -hmm. money. You literally were not allowed to make money if you played a sport. Right, right. So, and you're playing a sport all the time, and you are a full-time student, because you have to be a full-time student to play a sport. So you basically got two jobs and no no money from either one. So <laughs> I wanted to make some money. So I responded to the bulletin board posting. Turns out this guy was in network marketing. Now, I did not build a career in network marketing, but I went to a few of the meetings. Now, at these meetings, two things happened. Number one is the guy on the stage was talking about these concepts of business and making money that made perfect sense to me. But at the same time, it made me question a lot of things because I have a business degree right. and no one in my college classrooms was teaching the things that this guy on the stage was saying. And again, in one meeting, he was saying things I never heard in four years of college. So I'm mm. like, why are they not teaching this at school? Because yeah. it makes perfect sense. And the second thing the guy said was, because anybody been to a network marketing meeting, I'm sure you've been to at least one, <laughs> uh, Corey. So when you go to the meetings, half the people in the room are already doing the thing and half the people are like the guests. Mm. So when he was speaking, he was addressing the people who are already in the business. He said, Make sure when you leave the room, stop by the little table and buy some of those personal development books. I never heard this phrase, personal development. And then he went and explained, if you're going to build a business, the most important thing you got to build is yourself. And I said, that makes sense. Now, you got to build up yourself and make yourself more valuable so you can build a business. Because if you're weak, then you can't build a strong business. It doesn't right. make sense. So those two things sat in my head. So I went outside when I left the room and I looked at the books. I could not afford the books. Mind you, I'm a broke college student. <laughs> so I didn't buy the books, but I took note of the books because he was name dropping these authors like Jim Rohn and Brian Tracy and Tony Robbins and Napoleon mm -hmm. Hill, Zig Ziglar. I never heard of these guys, but I remembered a few of them. And when I got back to school, I went on eBay. Now this is before you bought books on Amazon, eBay. And I bought a couple pirated copies of a few of the books. So I bought uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Mm -hmm. And that's where I learned that there's a way that you can consciously program your mind to basically alter your way of thinking, which alters your actions, alters your outcomes. That put me on a path of personal development. And the other book I bought was Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. 
Yeah. And in that book, he was talking about, hey, here's other ways that you can build wealth and make money in life besides just go to a job, work a bunch of hours and get a check. There's other ways to make money. And again, I have a four year college business degree. Nobody taught this in the classes that I was taking. So these two things just sat in my head. So that's the first point. Second point, mm -hmm. 2005, when I started playing pro ball, that exposure camp that I mentioned, Corey, right. the footage from that event was on this thing called a VHS tape. You remember those? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So the VHS tape, you know, that those Gen Zers listening to this VHS tape is like YouTube, but it's on a physical <laughs> version of YouTube. <laughs> yeah. right, so. I think I have some like somewhere right around me. Yeah. Right near right. me somewhere. Yeah. They're big. Yeah, I used to have a bunch of, I think my parents threw them away. I left them in their, in their garage. Right. But anyway, the, the VHS tape, you know, if you lose it, you leave it in the sun, it gets wet, you lose your footage. So I wanted to keep it. I needed that footage. That was the most valuable footage I owned as far as basketball. So I took it to an audio visual store. They put it on a data CD. I put that CD in my parents' desktop computer and I uploaded to a new website called YouTube. Mm, and YouTube okay. said you can put as much footage up as you want for free. So I put that video up. Didn't think anything of it because who cares about YouTube in 2005? Nobody. But a few months later, I went just to check on the video and I saw there were comments and there were players who were looking at this video and they discerned that this guy looks like he can play. So they started asking me questions in the comments like, who are you? Where do you play? How often do you practice? Can you make more videos about, excuse me, about X, Y, Z, whatever. Hmm. So I realized that there was an underserved audience out there, people who were basically like me, but they were just 10 years younger. They wanted to learn basketball, but they didn't have anyone to teach them. The advantage they had over people like me is that they could go to the internet and get information. Mm -hmm. Whereas in my era, if you didn't know somebody, you you were you by yourself. No, yeah, right. right, exactly. So I started putting videos on YouTube sporadically between 2005 and 2000, about nine. So about for about four years, four or five years, I would put videos up on YouTube whenever I got around to it because I went to the gym and practiced every day anyway because I'm an athlete. And then I just had this little hundred dollar camera. I would take it with me to the gym. I would just set it up right on a little bench next to the court and just let it run while I was practicing. I didn't even have a tripod, right? I would just let it let the camera <laughs> run. And whatever I did in the gym that day, I would just take little clips of it whenever I got around to it. And then I would put it on YouTube. Because again, this was not a priority because there's nothing to gain from putting videos on YouTube at this time. So about 2009, Corey, this is the, this is the third point. The phone's not ringing. I'm a free agent from basketball. I'm in between contracts and the phone is not ringing. So this is where I'm thinking to myself, well, what if the phone doesn't ring again? Like, what if this is, what if it's over? What if I never get another job playing pro basketball? Because I played in a few places by this point. But again, if nobody's called, nobody calls, you can't play. So at this point, I have a little audience on the internet from these basketball videos on YouTube. I've been blogging a bit on, like, I would use my Facebook to blog, just talking about my experiences playing overseas and stuff like that. Right. And I have been reading, I just read, like, the new version of Rich Dad, Poor Dad for the digital world, which was the four-hour work week by Tim Ferriss. And in that book, Tim, or on his blog, actually, Tim would talk about, hey, here's a way you can test out if you have a product idea on the internet. And I had an audience, too. So I said, let me read this. I read it. And I followed his little experiment, made this little one-page website, and I put up two products. One was a dribbling program for basketball players. Here's how you get better at dribbling the ball. And another one was shooting the basketball. And I priced these products at $4.99 a piece, just following Tim's little experiment. And I ran a couple ads on Google AdWords. This is all what Tim was explaining what to do. And I proved the viability of the product because people were responding to the ad and clicking that they were interested in the product. So I put a little video on YouTube to my audience. Hey, I got these new products. Go to this website, XYZ. And they immediately started selling. Hmm. So when I made my first sale, $4.99, I remember this. I had a little BlackBerry phone back then <laughs> and, a, and a light blinked. Uh, you got a new sale, $4.99. When I made that first sale, I said to myself, Corey, I could do this for the rest of my life. Because what I had just done was take an idea out of my head, out of nowhere, from scratch, made it into a, something that was tangible, put a price tag on it, and exchange it for money. What we now know to be intellectual property. Mm. Another phrase that I didn't know about back then. I just created intellectual property and turned it into a business opportunity. I officially became an entrepreneur that night. Mm. And I said, all right, I'm still playing ball. And hopefully the phone rings again. But I know I'm not going to be able to jump 40 inches in the air forever. Right? This is not going to last forever. But taking something out of my head and making it into something tangible and selling it, I could do that forever. My brain will last longer than my vertical jump. Right. So that's, <laughs> right. that's what I was thinking. So that's when I became an entrepreneur. This is about 2009, 2010. Around the same time, the ballplayers who were following me started asking questions about my mentality because 
they found out about the backstory. One year of high school, walked on D3. You know, you're basically hustling to try to keep your career going in pro basketball, even after all that. So they so I started talking about things like discipline, confidence, mental toughness, et cetera. And I started making these videos every Monday on YouTube. Now, by this point, I'm putting YouTube videos out every day mm. because Google had purchased YouTube. And they said, we'll give you ad revenue. We'll give you a share of the ad revenue the more your videos get seen. So now I'm like, all right, well, let me put videos out as much as possible. More videos, more views, more money. So I am making some money from the YouTube and now I'm selling my little five dollar programs. And now I have these ball players asking about mindset. So I started making these videos called the weekly motivation every Monday. Just a little selfie two to five minute video talking about this discipline and confidence and mental toughness. And I did that every Monday for 400 Mondays in a row. And two things happened. First of all, the ball player said, Dre, we love the way you, you know explain things. You sound like a, a college philosopher or a, a a coach or something like that. Like you could do stuff other than basketball with the way you're explaining this. And the other thing was people who didn't play ball started finding me hmm. because they said, Dre, I don't even play ball. But the stuff you're talking about, that Monday video, that stuff applies to everybody. And I never picked up a basketball in my life. So this mm. told me that I had an audience outside of sports. Yeah, yeah. That's really right. big too, because when you have a positive message, right? Um, I've noticed a lot with leaders who've been on my show talking here with me, a lot of the lessons that they're sharing with uh, corporations or other entrepreneurs are really lessons that carry over in life. Uh, personal relationships as well as professional relationships. There's a correlation between all of it. And it goes back to what you said earlier, which is if you are not developed as a mm. person, then if you are mediocre and chaotic, for example, as a person, that's how you're going to move forward in life and all your ventures, your relationships. And that's the difference between being someone who is an entrepreneur who, you know, who, who's self-developed Versus someone who just kind of throwing stuff to the wind, hoping it sticks and don't really have a, they don't have discipline. It's a big difference in the outcomes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. that was again, 2010. So this is how I knew, okay, I, number one, I can extract, I can take ideas out of my head and make products out of them. So that's the first idea I got from that. Second one was the, this mindset piece of valuable, valuable to people outside of sports. And the third one was, I can serve people outside of just the realm of sports, even though I'm coming from the background of being an athlete. So I had all those mm -hmm. in my head and I started building these pieces from 2010 through 2015. I stopped playing in 2015 and that's when I just dropped the basketball part and just kept doing more of what I was already doing. So by yeah, this point, yeah. I was writing books. I was talking about mindset. I had an audience of nine athletes and I was making more products. So that's what we've been doing ever since. And you have about 400 products now. I, I read. Is that like, is that, is well, that a, or basketball on the, on the basketball side? Most of those products came from basketball because I basically took every aspect of the game and made and a product broke out of it, it down. Yeah. Yeah. And then we got on the, the non basketball side, we probably got somewhere closer to 30 to 70, something like that. That's amazing. And you did a Ted talks as well. I know you covered uh, yeah. topics like discipline, confidence, and mental toughness. So again, right. those are the same things that you began discussing in the realms of basketball but on your ted talks you applied it to just like the everyday existence of people right how they would manage those things exactly so probably around 2014 ish that's when i started taking the stuff that i had been telling athletes and figuring out how do i make this applicable to someone who doesn't play sports mm -hmm. so i wonder like right now i mean we're having this conversation it's casual so i know you're not necessarily you know in that mindset being like, you know, the guy on the stage, but I am curious to know, like in this conversation, if you could share some practical tips uh, or exercises that individuals can implement um, to work on these traits, maybe if it's about confidence or I, knowing who they are, like what are a couple of tips you might want to just give that, that are universal for, uh, for self-development? Sure. I don't need to be on stage to do that. I do that. This is what <laughs> I do every day. So yep, yep. as far as what's one we want to start with? Um, actually, I would say probably the the self confidence part. I think many people are right. that's where they lack uh, the confidence yes. to move forward with an idea or an ambition. Yes, and confidence is also the number one thing people ask for. They go looking for the confidence. So, we, great place to start. So, I'll give you a, let me give you a, a little anecdote here, and I'll ask you a question, and audience can play along with this as well. So, 
There's this guy, I told this story in one of my TED Talks. So his name was Tucker. He was a high school basketball player and he was in 11th grade and he was maybe the 10th best player on the team. So basketball team is only like 12 to 15 guys. So he's the 10th, number 10 guy in the totem pole. So he's not very good. Mediocre on his best day. One day the coach comes into practice and says, today we're going to do an experiment. Instead of me, the coach, telling you, the player, what mistakes you're making, here's what we're going to do instead. I'm going to have each of you pretend to be one of your teammates all day in practice. So I'm going to go down the line. I'm going to assign each of you to pretend to be somebody else. And whatever mistakes they're always making, you're going to make them. And whatever they do well, you do that well. And he went down the line. He told each player, you're going to be him. You be him. You be him. And he does this whole thing. Now, Tucker, again, 10th best player on the team. By random selection, he gets assigned to be his teammate, Mike, all day in practice. Mike just happens to be the best player on the team. He's the leading scorer on the team. He was actually very good. He had a Division I scholarship already lined up for college after high school. Now, our, our storyteller, Tucker, 10th best player on the team, his assignment from the coach is to pretend to be Mike, the best player on the team, all day in practice that day. So, Corey, let me ask you the question. How do you think Tucker played in practice that day? I mean, I would imagine he aced it. He, you know, he, he nailed it. If he's, no if, he's imitating, if he's imitating the guy who's who's a badass, right? So that's what I right. think. Right. So did he just all of a sudden just get those abilities? How did he how how was he able to do that though? <laughs> now that's the impractical part that I don't know. Right. <laughs> so when I ask audiences this question, I just I give them a show of hands. Who thinks he played the same? Who thinks he played worse? Who thinks he played better? And it's usually about split between all three. Right. But you actually got it right. He played amazingly that day. And he was doing all kinds of moves and making all kinds of shots that he never even attempted all the other days. So his teammates are shocked by this because they're looking at him like, yo, where is this coming from? I'm like, why don't you do this? Why haven't you done this before? If you had all this ability. And mm -hmm. at the end of practice, the coach says to Tucker, well, that's all it takes. You need to pretend to be Mike every day for the rest of your life. <laughs> and what Tucker had done is he had tapped into what we call the super you. So our framework for confidence is what we call the super you. So it's still you being yourself, but it's you tapping into your highest level of confidence. And when I explain that, sometimes people hear it and they say, okay, so it's kind of like fake it till you make it because right. Tucker faked like he was Mike and then he played really well and he had this great performance. And my answer to that is not exactly, it's not exactly fake it till you make it. And the reason is you can't fake it in basketball. Right? When right. Tucker was shooting the ball, he didn't fake doing the move. He actually did it. And when he shot the ball, he didn't pretend that it went in the basket. It went in the basket. So there's no faking it. That was becoming is what it is. Mm -hmm. So the super you is not about you faking something that you're not, because the challenge with faking is kind of like the story of Cinderella, which, which we all know. Cinderella puts on the glass slipper and she becomes this beautiful princess in a ball gown. But then when the clock strikes 12, the glass slipper goes away and she goes back to wearing the rags. That's what happens when you fake it till you make it. You are mm -hmm. pretending something for a while, but your subconscious mind understands that since you're faking it, eventually the faking must end, which right, means you got to go right. back to where you were. That's the problem with faking it till you make it. So instead, you want to become it. And becoming it is about stepping into a certain aura, a certain energy, a certain mindset. And then you can perform at that level. And now you can use yourself as an example instead of using somebody else. So mm -hmm. that's what Tucker had done is stepped into the super you. And anyone can do this. It's a choice to step into the super you and become that version of yourself that you want to be. And the biggest key to stepping into a new level of confidence is, of course, believing in yourself and knowing that you can do it and pushing yourself and stepping into that higher level and all the things that you may have heard people say about confidence. But there's also another piece that often gets ignored. Mm. It is giving yourself, uh, Corey, the permission to no longer conform to being the person who you've always been. That's what mm -hmm. Tucker had done. Yeah. He gave himself permission to no longer be the 10th best player on the team who's mediocre on his best day. And he decided and said, you know what? I'm going to be the best player on the team today because mm -hmm. the coach told him to. And see, the difference between Tucker and all the rest of us is that Tucker has somebody tell him to do it. We have to choose to do it. Yeah. yeah. And then we have to stay there after that because, see, the experiment ended for Tucker. And guess what happened the next day? He went right back to being mediocre. <laughs> but see, the rest of us. We have to choose to step into it on our own volition, and then we have to stay there. And that's a, a mental conditioning challenge. That's not a, a skill challenge because clearly Tucker already had these abilities within him. Because it's not like when a coach said, you're going to be Mike today, that in 30 seconds, he all of a sudden became good at basketball. Right? Mm. He was mediocre before. So how did he get up? Where did the skills come from? Again, he already had the ability. He just had to give himself permission to use that ability because before that he was conforming to being the guy who he thought everyone else thought he should be. 
That's you know, the- yeah, I mean, it, that's such an amazing analogy, too, because it reminds me of um, when I read Obama's book, The Audacity of Hope. Mm-hmm. And even that title alone um, suggests that we are, um, again, programmed to just sort of exist at one level in many cases. And when we allow ourselves to say, you know what, I think I can expand beyond that. I'm going to expand beyond that. I think then what happens, which is great in most cases, is you're competing then with yourself. You're not competing with anybody else. You're challenging yourself to be greater than or to see beyond your neighborhood and go out in the world. And, you know, I get some of that from what you're saying too. It's like, you're making a commitment to Mm. you. There's no coach telling you to do it. You know, you're the one inspiring that growth and that change from within. You're controlling it. That's right. Yeah. And it's all it's all based on the internal conversation. That is amazing. Wow. Well, let me ask you, when it comes to basketball itself as a sport, I'm not really necessarily a sports guy, but I do I'm curious to know, um, when you've played around the world, did you notice a difference in how like each culture approaches um I guess basketball in different in different ways, or is it pretty much the same or is it regarded differently in other countries you've played in? Or what do you think about that in comparison? Oh, absolutely different. Every country is different. So they all have different uh, cultures around sports. So I would say a country like Lithuania, that was the first place I played. Excuse me. It was my first time outside the United States even playing in Lithuania. They have a very rich basketball culture. There are some Lithuanians, uh, pretty good ones playing in the NBA right now. Oh, okay. And at least one that I can think of, but there have been multiple. And Lithuania has, did they beat us? Uh, they, I know they came close to beating us in international competition once many years ago. I don't know if they've beaten us officially on paper in a game yet, but they've been very good for mm. several years. Very good with Wania. Yeah. So uh, they're very basketball crazed. Um, other countries, it's like they'll take it or leave it. So, like for example, Germany, where other sports are bigger in some of these other countries. So Germany is one. Montenegro is another where I remember we were in a nightclub. And I'm not even a nightclub guy, not after college, but mm-hmm. I was in a nightclub with my teammates one time, Montenegro. And we were in the, you know, the regular part of the club, me and a couple of my teammates standing around. And the VIP section was behind us. You know who was in the VIP section was the, the handball team. <laughs> they were in VIP. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, because here they would not even be in the club. They would not, yeah, not be allowed know in. Them. Nobody would know who they were. Right. <laughs> yeah. So the handball team, the oh, hockey team. Yeah. So in different countries, different sports matter more. So in Germany, for example, basketball, people know about it, but there are a bunch of other sports. Soccer, for example, is much bigger than basketball, Mm -hmm. even though basketball has a lot of fans. So Germany is probably like of all the countries I was in, probably the closest to America because there are a lot of Americans in Germany, a lot of uh, military, I guess their family and their spouses. So seeing a, a black guy walking around Germany is like nothing. Nobody cares. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Say, although when I was there, uh, like in 2006, they thought I was Lenny Kravitz for like five seconds. Right. Uh, and they were like following me around the, the 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 big cathedral and the train station. So I think in some parts you are kind of an anomaly. But uh, right. yeah, no, that's wonderful. I just was curious about that with different with different sports. So I want to talk to you about your book. Your current book is the Work on Your Game book. Yeah, well, I got a lot, but we can talk about that one. Okay. Well, which is your yeah. most recent one? Most recent one is the third day, the decision that separates the pros from the amateurs. Oh, okay. Well, let's talk about that one. So, because I know, because mm-hmm. the because the work in your game has a very similar theme in which you talk about the 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 athlete the athletic mindset. So this seems like a continuation of that. So share a little bit about what that book is about. Yeah. So I mean, the through line to all of our books is our is just personal and professional development. And the third day is about how do you show up and give your best effort when you least feel like it. So. Mm-hmm. That moment is what we call the third day. And the reason I call it the third day is because usually when someone starts something new, it's usually by that third day that they realize, oh, this is not all fun and games. It's not all, all going to be easy. It's not going to be as simple as I thought it was. Right. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the third one, two, three days in a row. It might be just the third time doing it, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And they realize, oh, this is not all fun and games. It's not one big party. There's some actual work I have to do here. There's going to be some grit and some grind to this. And the third day is not about so much, Corey, the uh, experience of that moment, but it's the decision that you make when you experience that moment. What Mm. do you do? Are you going to keep recording your podcast? Are you going to keep working on writing that book? Are you going to keep going to the gym and following what the trainer tells you to do? Are you going to follow through on this 
even though you're not as excited today as you were when you started. The new car smell has worn off. <laughs> Party's over. Now are you going to keep showing up? That's right. what the third day is about. Wow. That is excellent advice. And I love the correlation between the two. I've never heard mm -hmm. it put that way before, how they are, those two things are in lockstep. And that is wonderful. Uh, words mm -hmm. of wisdom from Dre Baldwin, former NBA player turned entrepreneur and author and speaker. And we are so happy you're here today with us. And uh, I'm inspired to go out and do a lot more with my life now that I've talked to you. And I hope everybody else listening will be as well. So thanks for being here today on Motivational Mondays. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity.